uh, passionate about deep shipwrecks. You're also world renowned as a diving physician and hyperbaric medicine specialist. And there's a heap I want to get into there. But before we go too far, let's clear up a couple of points. This is speaking side mount. Have you ever actually dived side mount? Uh, no, not unless you count uh, stage tanks or sling tanks hanging <laughs> off your side during a dive. So no, no look, the, the truth is technically, no, I have not. All right. Okay. Uh, and that probably reflects the fact that I'm I'm more of a wreck diver than a cave diver, although, you know, side mounts great in wrecks too. But, uh, you know, I've never had too much trouble squeezing through the sort of tight places that you really need to get through. You need side mount to get through. So, no. Yeah. I tell you it? what we're going to do. We're going to make an exception. And I, I've only done this <laughs> once before. <laughs> so, so here we go. You're on the show and uh, it's too late to cancel now. So let's carry on. So now you and I also so nearly go back a long way. In 1992, I was the Marine Engineer engineer officer of the New Zealand Frigate Canterbury and not at all related to your impending arrival, but I resigned my commission late that year and posted off just as you joined the ship for its 93 deployment. And I know we both loved our time on Canterbury. So let's reminisce a bit. Um, tell us about your time serving in the Navy and on HMNZS Canterbury. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Steve, I joined the Navy in uh, the beginning of 92. Uh, and the whole point of that was to do diving medicine. You know, diving had been driving my career choices up to that point, And the Navy was no different. Des Gorman had just arrived and, you know, that place was quite a hotbed of diving medicine interest so I joined the Navy in 92 and then got really lucky in 93 to get put on Canterbury for that round the world deployment you know as you know we went up through the Amazing. Pacific through Panama the UK the Baltic Stockholm down through the Med through Suez Canal back down through Asia it was extraordinary deployment and uh, you know I was a medical officer and uh, had this it was just the most amazing adventure you know as you well know you know you see and do things in the navy that you would never see and do in any other circumstance and yeah that deployment was was no different uh, amazing yeah. time yeah it, it was a brilliant time to be in the navy too because we happened to be in just this stellar period of peacetime as well so there weren't really any wars for us to go and fight so of course we go and do what we do and, and we practice uh, warfare and at the same time there's a fairly large diplomacy uh, requirement for a driver for the navy and the, and the forces as well and yeah i mean the deployments i, I did uh, brought wellington back from the uk and had a similar experience of crossing the planet and a warship and you know, stopping off at various ports and experiencing different cultures and meeting people from various services around the world as well. It is. It was an amazing time, wasn't it? Uh, incredible. Yeah. I mean, you hit the nail on the head when you said you know you go to all these different places. They're all exotic. They're all very different, and you meet really interesting people. Get to experience these cities from you know from your own little personal floating hotel where everything's kind of laid on for you. <laughs> But, it, but especially, I, you know, the thing that struck me about it was you're also on board a ship with all these really neat guys, you know, and it's, mm. you form these extremely strong friendships that kind of last a lifetime, even if you don't see these people for years, you know, when you yes. do get back together with them, it's just the same. And even you and I, you know, like, because we, we actually never sailed on a ship together, but because we had that shared experience and understood exactly what we were respectively talking about you know when when we met at northland dive last year yeah. you know we had two hours of conversation that just flowed like a river because exactly. you know we knew exactly what what we were respectively talking about no amazing time it really was yeah 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 and it's a ship as many of our listeners know i've you know, i wrote a book on canterbury and i've done many hundreds of dives on it now and and it's it actually is believe it or not it's a purpose sunk wreck and yet it's one of my favorite wreck dives ever and I've been, i mean i've been to truck lagoon i love everything there but canterbury is just such this amazing playground you know a lot of it's very benign and, and designed for the the lower end of wreck diving and then you know some of the deeper spaces are genuine you know overheads and in really quite challenging dives and so um it's have you had, have you done very many dives on Canterbury or have you had the opportunity to go and revisit some of the spaces that you knew so well oh yeah uh, I wouldn't say I've done a lot of dives I've been there a couple of times uh, my mm -hmm. big priority was to visit my uh, cabin uh, yes. which was 
strategically placed as it turns out right next door to the officer's heads uh, <laughs> you know the, the the logic being that the medical officer would get to hear uh, any gastrointestinal disorders that were prevalent amongst the officer cohort and actually quite interestingly uh, your your successor uh, the MEO yes. was pretty interested in that himself you know a self-appointed <laughs> medical officer and uh, yes. used to spend quite a bit of time in my cabin uh, you know, laughing our heads off at the various noises that were coming out of the officer's head. Uh, no, it was a so my cabin was right next door on the officer flat. I Yours know, the, I know the, the cabin. Side, if I recall correctly, um, yeah, well away from the heads. Very strategic of you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you yeah, know, I've been there, and I've yeah, I've been through most of Canterbury. Yeah, I know. I totally agree. Actually, it it is a it's a dive that has something for everyone, uh, even mm. if you're a moderately experienced advanced wreck diver and light crawling into the tight dark spaces. There are some places like that on Canterbury. So yeah, mm. highly recommended and a lot of emotional, um, I don't know. Yeah. For me. Yeah. Yeah. People often ask me what it was like, you know, diving it. And certainly the first time I, I sort of wasn't knowing what to expect. And I dived it about three months after it was sunk. So there was this kind of oh gee there's my ship on the bottom um it was very clean in those days as well so it was very white um even, even though it's a <clears throat> it's a warship gray um it looked white underwater and the um yeah it was quite stark the first time and interesting and of course yes i made a beeline for the meo's cabin and i did spend a bit of time down your corridor there so as an assistant engineer that's usually where you end up as well although you don't tend to get that last cabin so yeah, know it well, and and um, but sort of now, I think it's I'm I'm so happy that it's a dive wreck, you know, compared to being scrapped and and turned into razor blades, as we say, you know, what a great use of a shipwreck at the end of its life, given that they don't tend to have a lot of value, and you can strip out a lot of the expensive equipment and so on. Um, I I just think it's the best thing you can possibly do to a ship once it's finished its life in service. Yeah, no, I I completely agree. Uh... It would have been terrible to see it broken up, and and you know now people can go and visit it. No, I, I'm I'm totally on board with that, and I and I also agree that it was weird seeing it underwater. But you know when you rationalise it in the way you just did, Steve, I I yeah exactly right. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's move on a bit. So we talked a little bit about um, the way that the, you got into the Navy to forward your career in diving, but let's talk about how you got started in diving and then how, in fact, did the Navy uh, progress your career and what did you do there? Yeah, look, I grew up in Wellington and uh, in a little seaside suburb in the eastern suburbs out beyond the airport called Sea Toon, and mm -hmm. you know, we had that whole south coast of Wellington uh, kind of right at our doorstep. And it was just what the kids in our suburb did, you know. So I'm talking around the ages of 10 or 11, you know, we we would just mm -hmm. walk over to Breaker Bay, put a jersey on, on our tops, a jersey <laughs> on our bottom, you know, like they couldn't afford a wetsuit, have a stick with a nail tied to the end of it and tried to stick it into fish, of course, quite unsuccessfully. But, I mean, the whole underwater world thing had this amazing um, beauty and intrigue about it. And... Uh, you know, I just, I just completely fell in love with, with diving and, mm. and everything, everything beyond that point was towards every, everything, every choice I made in my life was towards furthering my diving career. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I left school, I went and did marine biology. When I finished that, I went to medical school. And, you know, that was all quite a story because I wasn't a particularly good student. I had to work very hard to get into med school. Um, mm -hmm. I was diving too much. That was the problem. <laughs> diving when yes. I should have been in class. Studying, huh? yeah. But it, I mean, it is one of the things about diving is that it can grip you in that way. You know, it it's not just a sport. It can become a lifestyle. You know, like I remember doing mm -hmm. paper rounds just to be able to afford to buy scuba gear and I couldn't even buy it all at once. So, you know, I had a scuba mm -hmm. tank sitting in the middle of my mm -hmm. bedroom for years, you know, before I could buy a regulator. And then, yes. so, you know, it's, it does grip you in that way. So yeah, after leaving medical school, I just wanted to do diving medicine. And I think I mentioned before, Des Gorman had just arrived from mm -hmm. Adelaide, uh, created a very vibrant kind of prestigious uh, diving medicine environment in the New Zealand Navy. And so that just was a logical extension. And I, you know, I followed him in there and, 
and absolutely no regrets. I mean, the Navy was a fabulous place to be at that time because so we're now we're talking the mid 90s. There was a lot of diving happening in New Zealand. Uh, we had a very exuberant diving population who weren't particularly good at following the rules and we were, <laughs> we were yes. treating a lot of decompression sickness. You know, in 1995, we treated 100 cases of decompression sickness. Yeah, and so I think we have to remember, years, remember sorry? computers computers went in, in broad use at that time. So, that, I mean, it was very much a tables-driven time, wasn't it? It was, and, it, and that meant a lot of people were just too lazy to actually do the planning. And yes. so they, uh, you know, there was a lot of guesswork going into diving. And I think that that contributed to it. I mean, that's quite multifactorial, that whole story about why mm. there were so many cases back then. But yeah, in terms of getting experience-based expertise in diving medicine, just brilliant and hard to do now. You know, we're treating like less than a quarter of those sorts of numbers these days. And mm. You know, for someone coming into the field now, it's really hard to, you know, to get a case, you know, to do cases uh, because they're just not so many. So a great time to be there. And, you know, the chamber was brand new. Des was there. Lots of lots of cases. It was a really good time to be in the Navy. Mm. And, and one of the things that's always interested me is you were able to clearly meld your medical career with hyperbaric medicine. And there seems to be a connection between anesthesiology and diving medicine. I mean, what are your thoughts on the relationship between the two disciplines? Yeah, that's a really good question, uh, Steve. Of course, I didn't do anesthesiology until somewhat later. Uh, mm -hmm. But you're right, there, there, are, there are quite clear linkages. I mean, and they're both clinical and theoretical. So, you know, in diving, we deal with gas physiology. We, we breathe from gas supply equipment and in particular rebreathers, which are sort of circle circuits. And that's exactly what an anesthesiologist does every day of their working lives. You know, they run mm -hmm. circle circuits, they run gases, they deal with gas physiology. So there's that kind of equipment linkage. And then there's this whole thing that you know, anesthesiology teaches you a lot of life support skills. So, you mm -hmm. know, you airway management, resuscitation, the use of, you know, cardiac supportive drugs. Um, in other words, an, an, an anesthetist is probably the person you most want hanging around if you decide to have a cardiac arrest or some mm -hmm. kind of critical event like drowning. Uh, you know, an anesthetist is, is very highly skilled in all the things that they you might need, all the right procedures you might need to deal with a situation like that so mm -hmm. anesthesia is a very appealing specialty to someone who's contemplating being out in the field with divers where things might go wrong and they might have to step in and you know take active steps to you know save someone's life and in that sense you know no disrespect to my dermatology colleagues but you know you'd rather have an mm -hmm. anesthetist than a dermatologist um sure there's plenty of times when you'd rather have a dermatologist, but that's not one of them. Yeah, yeah what's and, this nasty rash I've got here? That's yeah, right. <laughs> well, yeah, so you're an ex-Navy guy, but, um, you know, that, that is, that, that, that's kind of the point too. So anesthesiology has these linkages with diving that are both clinically based and based on the sort of, you know, theory and um, practices that we use in the operating room.